that are available to us today. And we have with us a gentleman who's talking about some of the facts, factual evidence that support Noah's flood, dinosaurs, and the intelligence of men prior to Noah's flood. Please welcome back to the program from Glen Rose, Texas, founder and director of the Creations Evidence Museum, a discoverer and excavator of a major dinosaur. Please welcome Dr. Carl Ball. Dr. Ball, good to see you again. Well, you what a pleasure to have you back with us, sir. Thank you. My the last time to be you here. were with us, you brought this huge foot and uh, pointed out that there were basketball players today that had feet just the size yes. of this man who was supposed to be a prehistoric man, but could be walking the earth today. What have you brought from your travels with you this time? Oh, I've brought a lot of things. Now, um, in addition to what I brought from the excavations at and around Glen Rose, Texas, uh, we had flown in Do me just a favor, for the telecast tonight. Bring people up to date on what Glen Rose, Texas is. Some people All might right. be tuning across. Now, what is Glen Rose, Texas? I mean, is that like the Alamo, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Glen Rose is a great metropolitan area of 2,000 people. <laughs> just a small town. But people come from around the world to observe what is there because uh, uh, tremendous footprints, beds, trails of sauropod and theropod dinosaur footprints have been found. Now, the sauropod dinosaurs are those with four legs, uh, like uh, Diplodocus, uh, Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus by a common name. Theropods are uh, creatures that are normally considered to be meat eaters like Tyrannosaurus rex, Acrocanthosaurus, Allosaurus, etc. During the excavations this past month, we excavated 13 new dinosaur footprints, 13 new dinosaur footprints, after removing ledges of limestone. Now, Ben, this is original excavation, is a scientific procedure. We don't just go to the bed of the river and try to dig up out of the gravel what has been exposed by nature. We, with precision, delicate, operation, remove the overburden of limestone, a layer of clay marl that averages seven inches, and then we delicately excavate the next layer and we find these prints. Now this 13, total of 13 new dinosaur footprints brings our total to 303 dinosaur footprints excavated at Glen Rose under my direction in the last uh, Oh, since 1982, the last 16 years. Now, now, is there any doubt? I mean, I mean, this is not like some holes in the mud that could pass for anything, you know, like, hey, that's a dinosaur track, Holmes, you know. Uh, you're, you're a good host. I mean, <laughs> you, you drive a guy to really bring out the truth. There's no doubt whatsoever. Leading paleontologists worldwide have visited Glen Rose and have identified these tracks. In addition to that, some of the tracks we excavate not only have, like the three toes, uh, the digits, the hallux, or the spur heel, but actually have the claw marks still in place. They are that delicate. Wow. But now here's the mind-boggling thing. Among those dinosaur footprints, we have excavated now a total of 69 human footprints among those dinosaur footprints. Early July, just a month ago, we excavated a good human footprint. July 3rd, 1977, we excavated a pristine human footprint right in the middle of a dinosaur track. Now this track, human track footprint, had all five of the toes, the ball, all three arches, metatarsal, medial, and lateral arches, the heel, calcaneus section, everything that your foot has, a specific human footprint right in the middle of a dinosaur well, that, that footprint. That can't be. I mean, that, according to scientific, no. currently accepted scientific theory, that can't be because dinosaurs lived millions of years before man, quote, evolved. According to currently accepted scientific theory. But there are a number of scientists who are recognizing that something of major import is going on. For instance, we have not only human footprints, we have a human digit, a fossilized human finger, the fourth finger on the left hand of a girl. It's so specific, some of the scholars have identified the gender. 
It has the fossilized fingernail. Now you're going to tell me it had a wedding ring on it. That's why no. they can tell it was a girl. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no wedding ring. But the, the fossilized fingernail, the cuticle, the taper, all three of the joints, we sectioned it and we found the cartilaginous ligaments. In fact, I was on uh, a national program, 50 million people watching the program, Sweeps Week. I, uh, Charlton Heston was the moderator of the program. And I brought in uh, a leading medical expert to identify this fossilized human footprint, Dr. Dale Peterson. And uh, we sectioned it, and he identified the cartilaginous ligaments, the bone, the epidermis, everything identical to a human finger. How old was this finger? Okay. Now, you mean how old was the person when they lost yeah, the, the mean, finger? I mean, no, but how old was the... I mean, is this 200 million years old? You know, is this was... You know, how All old... Right. The, oh, you're, you're a good host. I mean, you drive a fellow to, uh, to the brink of truth, and that's what <laughs> we want. We are looking for truth. According to the standard evolutionary theory, which I used to believe and teach, these layers in which this finger was found are 105 to 110 million years old. But according to the truth, it's less than 5,000. All of the layering, less than 5,000 years old. Let me show you why. You and I were discussing before the program tonight, is there evidence for a worldwide flood? Noah's the great flood. The great flood, Noah's flood. There's only been one great flood. Right. Is there evidence? Yes. Then worldwide, there are raised beaches and terraces on mountaintops and progressively down the plateaus of all the continents so that water would have met a level, then would have assuaged and met another level, leaving a beach and a terrace each time. In addition to that, worldwide, there are great fossil beds such as the Cilician horse beds in Sicily. They found uh, tens of thousands of fossil horses. Now, are these these little three-toed, funny-looking things they tell us were, or were these like real horse horses? Uh, horse horses, Texas horses, <laughs> you know, standard horses. Right. Now, an amazing thing, you brought up a very interesting point of conversation. We're taught, uh, and I'll finish that thought in a moment about evidence for the flood, but let me interject because you mentioned three-toed horses. Uh, we were taught in school that you had the dawn horse, Eohippus, uh, three-toed, and then uh, later you had the modern type horse. Well, uh, there's a little creature called the Hyracotherium in Africa today, about the size of a small goat that lives on the cliffs in isolated areas, that has four toes on his back feet, three toes on his front feet, and he looks identical to the fossil that's been identified <laughs> as the dawn horse. Not a dawn horse at all, it's an hyrax. <laughs> In addition to that, even National Geographic published some years ago and admitted, and that's certainly an evolutionary publication, they admitted that you find three-toed horses living at the same time with modern hoofed horses. Now that's a surprise to most people. You see, that was there, some fast evolution, man. Oh, I mean, there were three-toed horses. In fact, what we find in these great fossil beds worldwide essentially was laid down during this global flood of Noah's day. And before the flood, there were three-toed horses and hoofed horses. In fact, probably in the lush tundra and fauna before the flood, probably the three-toed horse would have been superior because you didn't have the harsh plains and the rocky cliffs and the barren terrain. So a three-toed horse would be superior. But after the flood, the dominant reception would be to a hoofed horse because you would have barren context. Now back to the evidence for Noah's flood. Oh, but just one quick, quick, quick but the, these three-toed horses, these three-toed horses did not evolve oh, no. into the hoofed horse. That was the point. Oh, okay. uh, didn't evolve at all. They, they were specialized. In fact, the genetic potential is there for variability, depending on the ecological conditions. Now, we all vary, and uh, we 
we respond to the environment and God placed within the genetic code mm -hmm. of all kinds the ability to survive in a specific environment. So they didn't evolve at all. They were all created simultaneously. It's like uh, some cats are larger, some are smaller, some are adapted to particular uh, terrain and conditions. That's true for all of us, mm. uh, for all kinds. Correct. Right. But the, the genetic code is there. Uh, Noah's flood. Uh, back to Noah's flood. How many hours do we have? We, by the unfortunately, way? we're going to have to move on to get some good stuff in here. <laughs> oh, Keep it posted on the time there. We have a lot to talk about. Yes. Uh, raised beaches and terraces. Then we have great fossil beds indicating that tremendous herds of creatures, elephants are thrown together, horses thrown together, uh, tens of thousands of them all washed in as if they were herding together and overcome by a tremendous flood. For instance, uh, I'm currently excavating a major dinosaur in Colorado. I have the privilege of being the discoverer of two major dinosaurs. One, an Aquacanthosaurus, the second, the Stegosaurus, and his buddies. Now, preliminary indications are this is the largest Stegosaurus ever found. Um, he will stand 14 feet tall and 33 feet long. Wow. That's a large That's a stegosaurus. Lot of dinosaur. Now, we have found not only a tremendous number of bones of this primary dinosaur, but we have found bones of seven other creatures washed together. Some of them sheep size, some deer size, some very small, some extremely large like this big stegosaur all washed together. In fact, the stegosaur was on his back. His bones uh, are upside down, and they're all compressed together. He was simply washed in in fluid mud. Wow. This required a context of tremendous fluid dynamics in order to cause this. Noah's flood. Noah's flood. Now let's take it another step. Wait, wait, now, we got to get some, we only got 25 minutes left, oh, and we okay. got all this great stuff here that uh, I want to find out about, ex where do we, this, this is probably be the first time many people watch this program, I know I'm one of them, that you will ever see dinosaur skin. Listen to me, we're going to show you right now actual fossilized dinosaur skin. Now, am I saying that correctly? You are saying it correctly. Ben, uh, not only will this be the first time many of our viewers are seeing this, uh, but it, some of these things are being shown for the first time to a public audience. This was flown in just late this afternoon from South America by special permission and special contribution of a museum in uh, Peru. Wow. Dr. Javier Cabrera is a major scholar, uh, and we're depending on his academics and uh, the background. In fact, he uh, is the founder of Ica University. He is retired uh, head of medicine at uh, University of Lima. The work that he has done, he's had checked for antiquity at the University of Bonn, the University of Peru, and NASA to show that what I'm going to show you tonight is had checked for antiquity within the grooves of the material. But first to the dinosaur skin. This was flown in from Bolivia just for the telecast tonight. Have you ever held dinosaur skin? No, sir. This will be a first for me. And now, first, I want to say that I promised my wife before the telecast tonight that I would disinfect all of this, and it has been <laughs> disinfected extensively, so you don't have anything to worry about. So I want to get into dinosaur viruses here. Uh, uh, correct. It's all disinfected in every proportion. Uh, can you hold that, tilt that up slightly so we can see that and, and point out that this, I mean, that, look at that. I mean, that is... Well, I want to point out some major things, Ben. Great. Most people think of dinosaurs as being brute creatures uh, that were very primitive early in evolutionary development. There was no evolutionary development. We all vary. Uh, but look, here is a rosette, a petal system around a central 
stamen area, another rosette, another rosette, a portion of another. Wow. And the section of the skin, uh, possibly from the frill area, or creatures like stegosaurs had beads under their chins, probably for uh, protection as they rubbed against the various plants and so forth. This could be a portion of those beads, and this has been, uh, these beads have been scientifically verified. Uh, a rough portion under the, the neck, uh -huh. uh, under the throat, but most people think of dinosaurs as being brute primitive creatures. Look at the rosettes. Now to Dr. Javier Cabrera. Dr. Cabrera began making the collections that I'm going to show you here tonight in the 1960s. But in the 1960s, it was not known that dinosaur skin had rosettes, had beautiful patterns. Oh, by the way, I didn't let you hold this. Yeah, I, I was going to say that. I was, I was going to mention that. I am now. Very I can get a shot of this. I'm holding actual dinosaur skin. Fossilized dinosaur skin. Um. Notice the internal structure is porous. Notice the back of the structure has lacing as if compressed with general patterns of rosettes, but the specific pattern is out mm -hmm. here on mm -hmm. the surface of the skin. Wow. I that would could be say, Godzilla's grandfather, man. I'm holding Godzilla's yeah. grandfather. Whew. Now, we will put this in safety deposit. Very few people will ever get to touch it. Wow. So, um, it's priceless, of course. Good grief. Now, Dr. Javier Cabrera has worked with the context in Peru, with the Ica Indians, the Nazca, and uh, other Indian groups of the past that date from 1000 B.C., to 1500 A.D. And remember, when he first began collecting these rocks and figurines that he purports, and we have no reason to doubt his integrity or his scholarship or the authenticity, he purports to have received these directly from the burial grave sites where the Ica and Nazca Indians uh, in generations past buried them. Now, we have disinfected these extensively, plus ultraviolet radiation has done a lot to cleanse them. But I want you to notice, Ben. Now, this is one of the actual stones from the grave. According to this scholar, scholar. Dr. Javier Cabrera. So this, this would make the stone about how old? Uh, about 500 A.D. Okay. Most of the material here, other than the dinosaur skin that, in our opinion, dates to Noah's flood. Most of this material would be around 500 A.D. Now, I want you to notice something special. This is a sauropod. See the long neck? Yeah. The four legs and feet? It had turned, yeah, there you can get a look. Can you look okay. at that? Pull, up, pull back just a little bit, Mr. Director. So we can see, there we go, right there. That's a dinosaur. Now, remember, this has never been seen on television before. Only hours ago, this was in his museum. Wow. And it's a direct contribution to the Creation Evidence Museum. But notice frills on the dinosaur, on the sauropod, and rosettes in the pattern of the skin. Now, remember, this was collected back in the 1960s. And it was not until just a few years ago the dinosaur skin was found with rosettes. If anyone fabricated this, they had to know that dinosaur skin had rosettes. But now, notice a, a human being is riding this dinosaur. Well, that's a, a man on a dinosaur? A man riding a dinosaur. Alley oop? I mean, this is, this is, <laughs> <coughs> this a man on a dinosaur? Well, I mean, this is kind of like, you know, uh, it, you know, Icarus, who they pasted wings on, he flew too close to the sun. I mean, you know. Oh, but there are no wings on this one. In fact, he has instruments uh, one has instruments of war. You see a spear, two type spears, and a shield. Now, in order to have so faithfully drawn this dinosaur, people had to see living dinosaurs. That wrecks the theory of evolution. Now, Ben, watch this. There are frills on this sauropod. It was not until three years ago that a paleontologist working out uh, in the western United States, found preserved frills on the spine of a sauropod. 
Are you saying that up to three years ago, the best scientific knowledge, there was no scientific knowledge that there were actually frills on these dinosaurs? That's they, correct. They didn't know this. They didn't know this, particularly on the sauropods. But frills are on this sauropod. That had to be a living specimen that was seen sometime in the lifetime of these individual uh, artisans uh, within the last two or three thousand years. They had to see a living dinosaur in order to so faithfully represent that dinosaur. Can you get this other rock over here? Uh, uh, do, you just, do you still just call them rocks? You know, I'm not they're they're gravestones. Gravestones, I'm sorry. And they're you're... very heavy. Uh, I'll say. Now, is the black, I mean, did, I mean, these are, are these some kind of no. way, so do you did this so you could see them in relief, or is this well, the way? Well, now, I've never touched these okay, until so tonight, got them and I didn't touch them until I disinfected them. <laughs> okay. But Dr. Javier Cabrera, the scholar who we trust and have no reason not to trust the integrity of this scholar, verifies the antiquity of the grooves and that some of the actual dust from the grave, graves, is still in the grooves. Notice the shield. This is Triceratops. That's an armored. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, they're taking them to war, like like an elephant, like Hannibal's elephants. Well, uh, here we have the tongue of the creature coming out. We have an individual riding him with a spear and a shield. You have to turn it down axe. just a little, or turn okay. it up just a little bit, so we can see the individual riding it. There you go. Can you see that? There's a guy riding this thing with a pipe in his mouth? Is that a peace pipe or? Uh, it's, no, it's, it's that looks like a hatchet. Yeah, it's a hatchet and, and uh, good grief. Now, let me point out something very special. Dr. Cabrera has some of the stones that show individuals fighting dinosaurs and there are only two areas where their hatchets are touching the dinosaur. One at the brain and the other at the pelvic ganglia. Paleontologists have found there were two spots that were vulnerable in the dinosaur. Get out of town. One was the brain, <laughs> the other was the pelvic <laughs> ganglia. How would they know the vulnerability and the portrayal of that unless they had seen living dinosaurs? And killed them. And killed them or slain them, slew them. Wow. So. There is a tremendous body of evidence showing that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, and that blows the theory of evolution. Now, in our opinion, this occurred recently, and the entire creation is recent. Uh, in fact, July 20th, just weeks ago, an issue of Newsweek said, Science, Science finds, finds God. God. Bought that issue. I remember when I saw it, I rushed right over and bought it. I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> You see, he's lost only to the minds of those who refuse to accept the evidence. Uh, do we have a minute to talk yes, about this? Yes, we do. Here's what this article and others, such as one that ran parallel to this with uh, Scientific American, plus a brand new book that I just received yesterday, Nature's Destiny, by a major scholar, Michael Denton, showing how the laws of biology reveal purpose in the universe. Mm. Now. What these scholars are now admitting is there is a design in the universe that is staggering. This design can not be ignored any longer. For instance, you imagine the largest physical thing possible, and it's the entire physical universe. Now, in centimeters, its size is listed as 10 followed by 29 zeros in centimeters. Then imagine the smallest thing in this universe, and it's a subatomic particle, mm -hmm. and its, si its size is decimal point, uh, 24 zeros, and a 1. Now man is right in the middle between those sizes. Something's going on. These scholars have now examined the carbon atom, which is essential for life and the basis for our existence. Mm -hmm. If its energy level were slightly more or slightly less, life could not exist. The mass of the electron in relation to the proton and the neutron, 
all have to be absolutely specific. If they vary just slightly, one part in 10 to the 50,000th power, we have lost the viability of life in the universe. It's called the anthropic principle. And it, what it simply means is scientists are now recognizing the universe was designed for man. In other words, you're saying that the, the, the odds on something evolving, exploding, Big Bang theory, and suddenly settling at this such a precise degree of Absolute accuracy. zero oh. in chance. Uh, in fact, uh, they have a figure on that now. The chance of life originating by evolutionary processes, Big Bang or any scenario you want to envision, the chance of life originating by naturalistic processes is one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. And anything <laughs> beyond one chance in 10 to the 50th power has zero chance of occurring. So scientifically, evolution is absolutely impossible. Now, other scholars such as Dr. Michael Denton are finding, uh, and Dr. Michael Behe publishing on this, major world-class scholars are finding that there's intelligent coordination, interdependence, and codependence in all living systems. You have to have it all in place or none of it works. Again, science finds evidence for God. Well, it's like right now in the modern uh, parlance, they're afraid that if the bees die in certain areas, and the bees are dying yes. in certain areas, yes. that the plants are going to die sure. because the... And, and so it all has to exist at the same time. All at the same time. Ben, you brought up something very interesting. Not only does it all have to be an existence by design and existing at the same time, but that means that the days of creation had to be literal solar days. You can't have these long evolutionary epochs of time. For instance, you mentioned the bees. Mm -hmm. The plants were created on day number three. Right. But the bees were not created until day number five. If None that was 5,000 years... <laughs> or a single year in between. That flowers had all died. That's right. They, it all had to be in a sequence that was extremely close. Now, uh, I, I brought our newest artifact. Yes, please. We, we're running out of time. What happens to the time? Okay, we got, what, 10 more minutes. I'm going to ask one of the assistants to bring this over here. We have something major. And this is our latest acquisition prior to well, the dinosaur a, skin. We'd have a drum roll or something. I mean, uh, fanfare? Uh, this is the first. There's the drum oh, roll. Oh, good. Yes, good. thank you. <laughs> That's Bo Williams. <laughs> good job. Good job. This has never been seen in public display before. Wow. Now, and I'm here. I'm here for this. I mean, I'm here for this. Remember, we're talking about man and dinosaur living contemporaneously, yes. such as Dr. Cabrera has been stating for decades. In fact, uh, has paid a great price academically for his position. Boy, you better believe it. Uh, all, you, all you do is just lose a professional career uh, if you make a statement like this. Yet, he is a tremendous scholar, uh, has a background of establishing an actual university, uh, retired... Uh, director of medicine, head of the entire department of medicine at the University of Lima. So he is a scholar of international renown. And we have found tonight that there certainly is evidence. For instance, he sent to the museum this ceramic dinosaur eating a serpent of some kind. And again, he's had this for decades in his collection. And uh, there are the rosettes. rosettes on it. And then you have the frills. Yeah. And the frills were not known until a few years ago. The rosettes were not known until just a few years ago. Three years ago for the frills, probably eight or ten years for the rosettes. And yet he's had that much longer. Wow. Whoever made that, if that's a copy, whoever made the original of that had to actually see living dinosaurs. Now to what we have here. I told you at the head of the program that uh, I've directed the 
excavation, have the privilege of being the discoverer of this big stegosaurus, an acrocanthosaurus. Uh, the excavation of uh, 303 dinosaur footprints and 69 human footprints. Now let me show you what we have, Ben. I hope the cameras can pick this up. We'll work on it until they do. In Cretaceous rock, Cretaceous means that uh, certain dinosaurs are found in this rock. We have a human hand. I was going to say, that looks like a man's hand. Yes. Now let's put my hand in it. Very few times do we permit this. I've got it. You've got it. You're a strong man. I hope the cameras... Well, you don't do it too long, Eric. <laughs> All right. Whoa, look at that. Not you only... can be a Cro-Magnon man. Oh, there. well. Uh, I want you to notice the central digit. When uh, Doug Harris, the studio that replicates these things for us, this is not a replication. This is the original. When Doug poured the latex into these fingers and pulled them out, inside the crevice of the central finger, the fingernail made a depression Thus, the fingernail was on the latex when he pulled it out. Wow. Not, not a fingernail from that individual, but the form of a fingernail. Look closely. The fingernail, the thumbnail is actually there. Yes, on it, makes the side. A, yeah, it makes a cut. The base of the hand is there. Now, that's an intelligent individual who survived the flood. That was an intelligent <laughs> individual who survived the flood that far. Now, I think... Um, if we have a few minutes left, you would ask at the head of the program about you want to put that how on the floor? smart these people were. I think I have it balanced for at least okay. a couple of minutes, unless we're going to continue to talk much longer. <laughs> how smart were these people who uh, lived among dinosaurs? How smart were well, these people? Well, I mean, you, the they all wore uh, skins and, you know, I mean, clubs and dragged the women around by the hair and that kind of stuff. According to the cartoons. And it was a very violent world before the flood, you know, so they may have done that sort of thing. But they were well-dressed. One of the early representations of Adam and Eve is found in this Eden tablet from Mesopotamia. It shows the fruit, uh, the tree, the fruit, the serpent, Adam and Eve dressed in robes. At least that's an early representation. I'm not sure how the camera caught that. Yeah, they caught it real good. But uh, let's talk about the intelligence of the people yes. before the flood. Ben, you and I have about 100 billion brain cells. That's pretty good. 100 billion, billion brain, brain cells. cells. Each I think one only of those, about 9% of mine are working, but 100 billion brain cells. Okay. Well, if you used 5% of that capacity, you'd be a super genius. Now, each of those 100 billion brain cells has 50,000 neuron connections to other brain cells. Each of those has 50,000 neuron connections to other brain cells. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm. We're integrated as a unit intellectually. Well, yeah, but in see, we capacity. are the pride. We are the end product of billions of years of evolution. Oh. That's why we're so smart. Actually, they were far superior to us before the flood. Watch this. During fetal development, while uh, before we're born, and uh, it's a child, not just a fetus. Amen. During fetal development, in the last six weeks of that child's life before the child is born, embryonically he produces or she produces a tremendous volume of new brain cells. But we don't have sufficient electromagnetic energy. We don't have sufficient oxygen. The mother smiles. But we live under one atmosphere of pressure where before Noah's, Noah's flood, there were at least two atmospheres of pressure, twice the atmospheric pressure. And at Texas A&M, they found if you double the atmospheric pressure, you triple the assimilation of oxygen. Okay, watch back to the fetal development. Eight minutes with lack of oxygen for a new brain cell destroys that brain cell. We lose half our brain cells before we're born in the last six weeks. Wow. Then the latest studies show that in the first three and a half years of life, because of lack of oxygen and lack of assimilation and lack of electromagnetic energy, we lose another half of what we had. Now, now we're running slap out of time. We got four minutes left to go. Okay. So you need to tell me what you're leading up to. 
I'm leading up to say that we only have about one-fourth of the brain capacity man had before the flood. He was, and each of those, we had about 400 billion brain cells before the flood. We ended up with 100 billion now in adulthood. Each of those has 50,000 neuron connections. We're stupid compared to the people before the flood. I, I, was in, I was in Lima. I was in Peru. And I saw these incredible stones. They must have been, what, tons in size. And they were fitted together in perfect, I mean... The Tiwanaka yeah. stones. Yes. And no mortar, no Correct. cement to hold them together. And they, they built... How did they do that? They were more superior than we. Now, those are post-flood stones, of course. Uh -huh. But before the flood... Uh, they didn't need computers. You were a living computer. You wouldn't forget unless you wanted to forget. You were an absolute walking, literal computer before the flood. Now, your organization built a biosphere yes. that has proven this, so to uh, speak? It, in principle. In fact, I'm the director of that scientific program. After 30 years of research, we've built a biosphere simulating what it was like before Noah's flood. Uh -huh. We built the prototype. We're now raising funding to complete the large 62-foot biosphere. And uh, we only lack about half a million dollars having all the funding for that building and that biosphere. What is that? What, what did it prove? What happened? Okay. You got two minutes. Got two minutes. In the prototype, we were able to triple the adult lifespan of fruit flies in the second generation. That's the equivalent of your living to be 200 years old. We were able to triple the growth rate of Pacu piranha fishes and able to alter snake venom at the molecular level so that it's three-dimensionally honeycombed, which means probably our tentative uh, analysis of this would be that snake venom in that context would not have the crimping sulfide bonds that provide the toxicity, so it probably was created not for venom, but a serum to be beneficial. Good grief. And all this because the atmospheres have changed. So back during those days when, oh my goodness, we are, I, mean, I cannot believe that you always come on when we don't have any time left. You do that to me every time. What, what, is, what is this last thing that we're holding here? That is the Nebonidus cylinder. In Daniel chapter 5, Daniel essentially saved the empire, or at least for the time being. So Belshazzar said, I'll make you third in the empire. Why third? We didn't know until the original of this was found. This is called the Nebonidus cylinder, which named Belshazzar and named his father Nebonidus, wow. who was absent, and it names Belshazzar as co-regent. So Nebonidus was on a military campaign, and that verifies the authenticity of Daniel chapter 5. Ladies and gentlemen, it's real. Make no mistake about it, it's real. A real dinosaur track, men live. God is real. Thanks for being with us. God it was a pleasure you. to have you. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you on the next edition of Praise the Lord. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today. Praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Or in Canada, write TBN, P.O. Box 768, Station B, Ottawa, Ontario, A1P, 5P8. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, Call our prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now until next time, remember to praise the Lord. This program has been brought to you through the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.